Welcome to The Advocate, where thought-provoking topics are discussed with no holds barred. Here on Plus TV Africa, we basically, we basically call a spade by its name. The issues of child brutality are what I'll be focusing on today. There are better ways to train a child. Juliet advocates for the need for professional workers to have a side hustle. Anne speaks on single parenthood. Felix talks about the need for women inclusion in all aspects and Victor talks about the expectations for the new year. Sit back, and after this break, we'll be here to dissect it all. Please stay with us. Spoil the rod, spare the child. Yes, you heard that right. Spoil the rod, spare the child. I just came back from a three hour interstate drive from a relative secondary school, where my close relative was hit by the school bus driver. I know, the nerve, right? a non-academic staff of a secondary school had the temerity to hit a student. But this is not an isolated incident. You know, further proof revealed that a student in the same school was flogged 24 strokes of the cane for touching another student inappropriately. Now, am I in support of inappropriate physical contact? Of course not. But also, is the punishment for such behavior physical abuse? The answer is a further resounding no. I traveled that long distance to pass a simple message to the management of the school, a forward message, very simple, yet very strong. Stop beating people's children. It is rather unfortunate that this conversation even has to be had in the year 2021. What was even more heart-wrenching was the information gotten that the children around the, you know, the incident, they laughed and chuckled when this dastardly behavior took place which goes to reveal, sadly, that not only had the staff crossed his boundaries, but the children had been indoctrinated to believe that it was okay for a child to be physically abused in their presence. So instead of reporting it, they laughed. The rot reeks to high heavens. Did you have a student who lost his life recently due to physical abuse by other students? At what point do we actually draw the line? At what point is it okay? for students to report physical abuse. But the children are not really the problem. You know, the problem didn't even start from the school. Physical abuse is a social, spiritual, mental, and a global threat. A pandemic that must be stopped in its tracks immediately. More often than not, the origin of physical abu abuse can be traced to the home, where some parents turn their children into punching bags and toys of prey. Their homes with different weapons of choice, brandished by parents, to meet out discipline on their erring words at the slightest provocation. More often than not, when you physically abuse your children, you're unconsciously telling them it's okay to be hit by someone who is angry with them. And I speak as a parent, I know firsthand what it feels like to want to punish our children for bad behavior. I personally believe the rod of instruction achieves better results than the physical rod of destruction. Child psychology is actually posits that when you beat your children, you not only cause them bodily harm, there is also a psychological and mental trauma that is attached. It is even more endemic in Africa, where being beaten by our parents is more or less, you know, bragging rights. You know, the one whose parents had the best beating skills was the most disciplined and no-nonsense no parent. Many of us even trade banter on our, you know, our growing up beating experiences. You know, the question is, where did that actually, all that beating, where did it actually leave us? Physical abuse is a social pandemic. It must be addressed by governments and societies everywhere. Physical abuse is a spiritual pandemic. Religious bodies and leaders must address it immediately. Physical abuse is a mental pandemic. It must be dealt with by everyone who has a functioning brain. Stop beating people's children. Whether they're your children, whether they're your staff, your spouses, your students, your wards, or anyone at all. Just stop it. I totally agree with you. We should actually stop doing mm -hmm. it, especially to other people's children. And I think it's coming from our own upbringing, where some of us were yeah, abused as children. Beaten to Mortis. obedience. <laughs> beaten to obedience. But what we had then was we knew obedience. You could say it was submission because we were fear. afraid, fear. Absolutely. So we had this in our mind, we're rebelling in our spirit, mm. but because we will lose inheritance, we'll be disowned, we'll starve and die, <laughs> we complied. But that thing wasn't obedience. Yeah. So we have to, there are other ways to get children to comply, to obey. I mean, there's the retriever system where you take something that is important and there's the naughty corner for very young children. Yeah. 
and you can even do the positive side whereby you come up and say you reward them for good behavior so they can now see what it is like to do the right thing but but whatever you do you should not force a child to obey you you end their respect Absolutely. and their ways to do this i mean that's my own take what do you think felix well, Victor, you know when he was saying this, I was just reminiscing about this in the secondary school. Yeah. We both went to military school at some Whoa. point. I did remember. As a matter of fact, I did. Corporal punishment, subjected to corporal punishment. <laughs> you know the way. But I stayed anyway. And actually, they subjected us to some level of corporal punishment. I remember when I crawled for coming school leads from when we came down from the bus, I crawled on the third route to into the school at the soldier. Soldiers were shouting at the back, come on, move, move. And to us, it was normal. But over time, I, I think I agree with your ideology. It's not wrong to punish children, but the punishment should not be, should not cause their emotional and physical harm. Not there are other traumatic. ways you can punish a child yeah. so that the child can have some level of recourse to think, okay, I reflect what I did was wrong and I need to apologize for my wrongdoing. On the other hand, too, most African parents, most Nigerian parents, they don't. Um, applaud their children when they do good. Yeah, you you only hear them interacting with their children when, when they do something wrong. And yeah. the interaction is, they wouldn't even want to listen to what the child has to say. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you child. have to listen to the child. Yeah. He may have done something wrong, but look at the intent. What was the intent behind what he did? If he did something wrong, but he had a good intention, maybe you need to just extribute the child. Be patient with your children. Yeah. And then when you do something good, when he or she does something good, applaud Reward. them. Yeah. I so agree. I think I agree with your sentiment. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I call it the, the thinking corner in my home. It's called the thinking. I don't call it a naughty corner. You know, because only in that corner you feel like, oh, I've been naughty. I call it the thinking corner. The reason is simple. Every child has the ability to think, to process information. So when they've done something wrong, I explain it to them. Then I say, go to the corner and think about it. So it's the thinking corner. So when you get that, because again, you know, language, communication is very important with this child. And they pick up things very fast. They do. So when you explain in detail what it is, and you say, go to the corner and think about it, then come back and let's have a conversation. I find this works for me, you know, and I feel like conversations, dialogue would actually work better than, you know, physical, you know, just being physical all the time. Exactly. You know. Uh, and shortly yeah. before Victor will respond to that, because mm -hmm. I knew you want to say something. This also transcends beyond parent-children relationship. If you look at government enforcement agency yeah. as a citizen, yeah. somebody is doing something wrong on the road and a soldier or a policeman will come, mm -hmm. rather than cautioning him, using the appropriate level of force that is allowed within the ambit of the law. Mm -hmm. You see them coming... With so sticks, with kobo. Attack. Attack. With they go home attacking. They it's come wrong. Attacking. Yeah, absolutely. It's wrong. Uh, yeah. You don't challenge... I remember when I was in secondary school, I had the opportunity of challenging a soldier because then I was in secondary school and I went to a military school. We went outside. He, they were, I, I felt they were harassing drivers on the road. And then I now said something. Why are these soldiers doing this? The man standing beside me was a soldier. He didn't listen to me. He hit me. I now said, it's because I was a student, they would let me go. And I looked at him and said... They can actually allow these people. It was like, you won't understand. But he actually hit me for saying that. I just let it go. But you see, this is wrong. We don't... If you want to correct somebody, you don't have to um, cause bodily harm to that person. You can actually correct the person and maintain your discipline as a soldier without causing bodily harm. So, Victor, you want to ship in something? Yeah, you know, all we know is all we've learned. And all we've learned is not all there is to know, right? So, I come from a business angle, right? So... If I want to get Juliet's money, I just need to know what to sell to Juliet to get out the money, right? So, and if you think about it, so if I don't know how to get to sell something to Juliet, I will use a weapon to get money out of Juliet. So either ways, we're all sort of like taking money from people. Now, some are doing it legally by selling a solution. Intellect, intelligently. Intelligently. Now, some are doing it by willpower. So I don't have what to sell. I don't have anything to but sell. But I want what this but person I want. has. So either way, Juliet is paying money to different sets of people. So if you bring it back to, you know, the issue that we have here, right? I, so it's what pe people will not do beyond what they know. It's what we were introduced to. It's what we grew up knowing, right? So as much as you say, oh, don't do that. It's hurting your child. Just like telling someone that is, that is drinking. Do not drink. It's hurting your lungs. I mean, the federal minister of it once as much as I like to die young, right? They see that on the sick, but they see smoke. So they can't hear that. Their ears can hear it, but their mind cannot hear it. So let's go back to the basic, which is how do we begin to re-engineer a new thinking system whereby people begin to see, you know, um, different other methods of correction. You know, there's things yeah. that we did in psychology around 
positive reinforcement somebody does well i reward my child Absolutely. you know they don't they do badly i take away the yeah. reward oh, you're yeah. not going to play ps2 Absolutely. you're not going to play game yeah. that's punishment yes. yeah that's yeah. right and, and, and it's with someone actually making them i mean for instance when i was going to drive here today my wife was like you're going to go out there i said yes because it starts with somebody saying this is wrong there was a time when owning, owning slaves was, was okay. Mm -hmm. It was actually legal. It was then it was a capital like, punishment yeah, was, okay, was okay, beheading people. You know, by the way, Anne, um, Anne, I'm sure you have something to say. <laughs> she's still there. Oh, yes. Yes, she's uh, right there. I grew up without being beaten. Personally, I can count the amount of time I was beaten by my parents, both of them. And I like to think I turned out quite all right without the beating. Mm. But... Um, in Kenya today, we have a lot of high school students burning down schools. So schools are getting closed. And now they are going back to the conversation of it's because parents are not beating their children. So I think this is a very sensitive topic. Mm -hmm. um, in Kenya today, they're saying we have stopped beating our children and that's why they are burning down schools and that's why they're not being as respectful as they should. So this is definitely a very, very sensitive topic to be discussing, but uh, I personally don't beat my daughter. I like to think that I can actually talk to her and she actually understands. Mm. But most of the parents are going to want to beat their children because that's how they think they have power over their children. So this is a very sensitive topic and thank you for bringing it up. We don't have to raise kids by beating them for us to feel listened to or for us to feel like we're instilling discipline in our kids yeah thank you very much Anne. and the truth is we can actually can't exhaust so we had said that we're going to have a whole episode to talk about this you know this yeah, actual topic. Because it's a, it's a big topic. The big topic. and you know and, and just to speak with Anne, to what Anne said sometimes just the impatience a child, i mean a parent just feels if i strike i can get quicker resort than, than yeah. sitting down and having a conversation and dialogue but thank you very much and thanks everyone um up next is Anne. Please stay with us. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And today I want to talk about a very controversial topic on single parenthood, it's a, it's a topic that many shy away from, and it's mostly because it's surrounded by stigma, especially in our African society, and you, and especially single motherhood has a, has has more stigma as compared to single fatherhood. But today, more and more, it's a reality that more and more people are finding themselves in single-led households, including teenagers, you know, who experience early teenage pregnancies. And today, I would like to look at the right side by examining some of the advantages of single parenthood. Yes, I am actually looking at advantages of single parenthood. I know, very controversial. Um, I like to think that uh, in when children are in single parenthood or in single-led uh, households, they get undivided attention because one parent is giving is giving each child attention as opposed to when parents are in in a traditional family setup where sometimes a parent feels like they don't have to put in their best because the other parent will definitely jump in for them another one is the freedom to make decisions we know families where people have grown up and parents are fighting about decisions concerning the child. And when you're a single parent, you tend to make decisions by yourself. So you want, so you, you, you anything concerning your child, you are the sole decision maker for them. Then in some cases, single parents can actually be very good role models. We have seen cases where children are growing up in very, very harsh environments where parents keep fighting, where there's a lot of abuse. But because you're in a single-led household, children don't necessarily have to look at parents having a lot of arguments. And this brings, a lot of, uh, this brings about a lot of peace and a stress-free environment for the kids. Uh, there's also the aspect of independence and responsibility where children become team members, you know, as a parent in, um, in a single-led household, because you can't do everything, you tend to assign 
responsibilities to your children. And give, this brings about an aspect of independence and responsibility in their lives. There's also a sense of belonging, whereby you see a lot of single parents depending on the society to help raise their kids. You know, you're depending on your, on your friends, on your family members. You're depending on uncles and aunties to be mother figures, to be father figures. And I think uh, this, this brings about single um, children brought about in single parenthood uh, societies wanting to around themselves with people there's also the aspect of being close to your to, to your child you want to know everything that is happening to your child in your child's life and this draws you closer to your children like i said this is a very controversial topic but today i just wanted to say that uh Single parenthood does not have to be stigmatized. There are actually advantages to be a single parent, and it's okay to be a single parent. Any thoughts? I agree with you, Anne. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and by the way, I don't think you're advocating for single... I think you're advocating for making the best of your single parenthood. I'm sure you're not advocating exactly. for people, exactly. you know, getting married and then <laughs> going <laughs> away so to be a single, single parent, because that's a better <laughs> idea. No. Than having, uh, no, just kidding. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, I totally agree with you, and that's basically... Make lemonades of your lemons. Ah, right? exactly. And we've heard stories of loads of loads of people, motivational speakers, you know, world business leaders that grew up with just their mothers, you know, mostly, more often than not, is you know, mothers, and they got very good training. You know, so um, I agree that um, if that's what you have, you can make the best of it. And there's always, you know, a silver lining in every situation that you are. Um, on the flip side of it, I actually have, I believe very strongly that it's better to be a single parent than to be in an abusive relationship, exactly. you know. So uh, what has been stigmatized is, you know, oh, so you're going to go and raise your child by yourself. I mean, you know, in the, in the meantime, discouraging the woman, more often than not, from walking away from abuse. You know, I think that, or you know, the man. or the man <laughs> in some cases, yeah, walking away from abuse. But I believe very strongly that people should be encouraged, you know, to walk away from abuse and then try and raise their children by themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, so, 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 so yeah. it was controversial because she, it was like she was defending single <laughs> yeah, yeah. but you have clarified and I think that's what she actually meant. Yeah. But, but, but the thing is about parenting is that we should always be intentional about parenting, yeah, whether yeah. you're single or so you're double. double. <laughs> but the thing is, two, heads, good, two good heads are always better than one. So I mean, so it's not about staying married, really. It's better for the two good heads to take care of a child than one good head. Yeah. But if you not find yourself being the one good head, whether the male or the female, because sometimes it happens the other way around where it's the guy who yeah. is a single parent. Yeah. Just make the best of it. Because ultimately, at the end of time, you're going to be held responsible for your child, whether it turns yeah. out right or not. You're going to be the one losing sleep, going to church every day, going to the mosque every day to pray for the child to be fine. So you have to be intentional about your parenting, whether you're single or you're not single. I think that's what this whole, this whole thing suffices. And you're trying to say also that there's hope for parents who are single and taking care of children. So I think that was a good one, and thank you so much for that. Well, um, actually, in our society, it's, the pressure is more on the single girls. Let me use that language. Because Slow if on. a girl becomes pregnant and she is not yet married, it's natural in our society. They will put pressure on her family. We say, ah, ah, how come you are pregnant? Where's the man? And all those things. Even if she knows that she's in a toxic relationship with the man or the boy, wherever, in the name of saving her face and the shame she of the family, she will, she will prefer to go into that to marriage remain there. and she, she will suffer. So it's, it's okay if you are sure and you know in your hearts of hearts that um, that relationship is toxic. It's better you count your losses and then take care of your child and yourself exactly. and keep a sane mindset and yeah. be responsible as your parents whether you are married or, or you are or, or married you you should if you are married and you have children you should be intentional about parenting if you are single and you're not married and you have a child or children you should also be intentional about be being a responsible, be responsible parent to your children Absolutely. Uh, life coach wants to say yeah, something. Yeah, thank you. Everybody has said really <laughs> yeah. interesting points. And it's really about just removing that stigmatization. And it's not even just about single parenting, like Anne has said. There are a lot of things that, you know, the Nigerian culture, you know, our, our, the way we process things, we put a lot of stigma and a lot of things. And this whole stigma, you know, drives people to make the wrong decisions. 
or like um, um, Gilles said, oh, should I go and look for a man to attach myself with so I don't appear stigmatized? So I think let's begin to, you know, talk more, right? Um, if you have any single person in your corner, support them. I have one in my corner and I'm always supporting, okay. going, checking, oh, has baby doing this? I'm always supporting because I know that, yeah. I know that they can feel, oh, they've left me, everybody has left me, they've me. Yeah. You know, the way that supports my baby to just marry her, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Even, even <laughs> religiously speaking, like um, um, Tolu said in the previous banter, you know, even um, church leaders, the, 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 the marks, you know, we all have a role to play. And not saying, oh, um, because oh, you're now, you're, you're, I mean, you know, paint all manner of scriptures and all those things. Support people, love people, and it's very important that we remove that stigma. That helps that person to really deal with that yeah. process, you know, Absolutely. and turn out really right. Absolutely. I think it's the thing that accuse them, yeah. not the single parent. Ex 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 exactly. Thing. So is that thing where, I mean, in closing, is that thing where once the foundation is, is, yeah. is shaky, there's a problem. If the reason why you're married a man is because you're pregnant for him or you have a child for him, the premise is already wrong. Yeah. So there, there's a strong, you know, possibility that you might, you know, struggle with um, with the marriage in itself. Yeah. yeah. All right. So Juliet is coming up next with a very interesting topic. Please stay tuned. Side business for career professionals. Most career professionals think that it is impossible to combine a side hustle with their day jobs because of time. This belief system is validated by the fact that people's work day typically starts at 8 a.m. and ends at 5 p.m. For my fans in Lagos and in some parts of the world, work day actually starts at 5 a.m and ends at about 9 p.m. on the average. On weekends, you have to do stuff you can't do during the week, right? You have to do your laundry, your social hangout, the self-care, recreation, and of course, more work. I am on this table. Notwithstanding this reality, the truth is that you can have both a great career and a profitable business. They are not mutually exclusive. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you how this is possible. A few years ago, I felt stuck in my career. It felt like no matter what I did, I just couldn't advance. This doesn't mean that I didn't move at all. I just didn't grow at a pace commensurate with my effort and potential. It was really frustrating, especially when other employees generally believed to be less competent they had rosy careers. We call them high flyers. So here was I, ready to do more for my organization with my strength and my talent, but unable to because of organizational noenders. I decided to put my energy, my talent, into monetizing my passion. I didn't make much money initially. In fact, I was doing it for free most of the time. What I did observe was that I was less frustrated. The distraction of running a business helped me eliminate all the negative emotions that I had been carrying inside of me. I found fulfillment because adding value to others helps you increase your self-worth. Fast forward to today, I have two successful businesses and guess what? I didn't quit my nine to five. If anything, I am better at my job as I apply my entrepreneurial skills in my job. I am innovative, visionary, strategic, result and people oriented. These are all entrepreneurial skill sets that I bring to my 9 to 5. Now there are many tricks you can employ to help you combine your day job and your side hustle. I will just highlight three today. Firstly, effective time management. Time is of utmost importance in the life of an entrepreneur. If you must succeed in life, what you do with your time must be of paramount importance. So learn to use your time wisely. Two, outsourcing. 
if you must work and run your business. You need to delegate some tasks to other people. There is a reason why people who can drive, they have drivers. And those who can cook, they have chefs. Three, align your business with your lifestyle and your availability. It will be stressful for an hostess, for example, to be a realtor who is always in the air. Who is going to take her clients to see the properties that are up for sale? Guys, what do you think about combining a side hustle with a day job? <laughs> <Very cut. laughs> I mean, I'm having to go first. <laughs> I, think, I think they're called entrepreneurs these days. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I personally believe, having worked in 9 5 and now being an employer of labor, one of the things I actually look out for in my team is people that have the entrepreneurial spirit. I would never recruit you if you're coming with an employee mindset. As a matter of fact, in the 21st century, there's no room for employees anymore. You must come into the business as a business owner as a solution provider, as a problem solver, not as a role filler. So you'll find in many roles in this in the 21st century that you know roles are now morphed into each other, you know, roles are now evolving. I was in my daughter's school, I think a year or two years ago, and they were saying during Christmas party that in 10, 15 years most of the roles that exist today will not exist. Most of the jobs, the jobs that the children of today will do, they don't even exist yesterday. So I mean the workplace is evolving. You know, problem solving would never evolve. You must always be a problem solver. There's skills, for instance. So they say, well, the robots are here to, you know, to take our jobs. But there's some skills that robots will never have. Yeah. Robots will never have emotion. They never have empathy. They have, I mean, there's so many things. Communication. You know, there's so many skills as a person that you must have, you know, that, you know, makes you add value to an organization beyond just, you know, filling a role. So I totally agree with you. I absolutely agree with you that... You know, one of the strongest points as um, a professional is your ability to solve problems. And that's what the entrepreneur does. You're, you're a problem solver. Add value. Thank yes. you so much. <laughs> well, side business or side hustle. <laughs> let me use your language. Side hustle. I, not necessarily. You know, some people always think that I must have a real physical business in quotes for me to have side hustle. Not necessary. You can actually have a skill and consult for people. You don't necessarily realize, you, according to you, plan your business according to your lifestyle. If you know you're that too busy person to sit down around because of the demands of your current job, you can actually hone that your skill that you have, hone it, consult for people, generate extra income. It's not until you have a physical location of the business that's when you are doing your side also. No, it's beyond that. I totally agree. So, life coach. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I hate the word hustle because I don't hustle, mm -hmm. right? I work. And I believe that we need to change that mindset of employers thinking that you employed my entire being. You employed my time. I'm here to give you value. If I'm here to grow your business from, you know, $10 million to $100 million in three months, I'll deliver that. It doesn't matter what else I'm doing with my time, right? So I don't say I work for XYZ company and then my side hustle is XYZ company. I work for two companies. Mm -hmm. I work for three companies and I deliver in all three companies. I saw someone make something that was really, I mean, it's my corner. He works for two companies. He got the job and he put everything on LinkedIn to present, to present. I was so proud of that. That's the new future of work we need to start em em embracing. So you don't hire me and think that you hired my Entire six bank. to six. No, I deliver. If I deliver, someone made a joke on Twitter. If I deliver my work by 12 p.m. and I can go home, the joke is on you, boss. I've done my job for <laughs> the day. Yeah. I'm going to start thinking in terms of productivity mm -hmm. and not clocking not time, time spent. Time. Yes. So the word yeah. nine to five should be erase from our, my, our dictionary. Say say the word, absolutely. What does that even mean? What is 9 to 5, really? <laughs> like, <laughs> if I, I mean, well, you know the history of 9 to 5, 9 to 5 if we wanted to go there, no. that's the industrial revolution. <laughs> you know, where they're basically industrial making, industrial but I mean, we can't even go into that. Anne, it's great to hear from you. Anne, what do you think? Let's hear from you. This is a very interesting conversation. And the truth is, uh, since, the, since COVID, side businesses are, coming, are now becoming the main hassles for many people if not in Kenya, in Africa. Because you find that uh, when people were previously employed by their employers, they have either deducted half 
their salary or three quarter of their salary and they're still expected to survive. So many people have turned to your, through their side hustles to become their their main mode of mode, mode of food or their main mode of earning. So having a side business is very very important and uh, it said don't don't um kudarao. Kudarao, it's like don't don't neglect the money that you see it's is too little that is coming from a side business because this this particular money can can be your saving you can use this money for a lot of things it can be your savings. It can be your hospital bill. It can be your, your your chance to you know to travel. So side businesses are very very important. But the thing is, I think a lot of youths do not know where to start because sometimes there's there's, there's the thought of side hustles need require money. So we, we, I think there also needs to be a conversation around around how to start a side hustle or a side business mm -hmm. and make it your main business. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I mean, and in concluding, I think very strongly, a note of warning though, which is something that is very important that we draw, is that if you've committed to a particular business for a particular number of hours, or you've committed to deliver certain results, yeah. it's important that you deliver on those. That and only then, can you say that you have time Very until true. you have delivered what you promised? Very and it's true. important that we mention this, you know, just in closing. Yeah. Until you have delivered that which you promised, you actually do not have, you know, the right to now say that you want to do a side hustle, which yeah. is why the things you mentioned, you like time management, like employer, and all the, uh, exactly. <laughs> so which is, which is the fear of a lot of, you know, employers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 the one yeah. we gave you, you've yeah. not even done it's it. Not it. Not you know, so you're not, yeah, exactly. so. Excellent. Yeah, that's um, true. Thanks. So thanks. this is the bit that which I'm happy you guys are agreeing yeah, with me. Like an so yeah. life is about giving value, mm -hmm. and side business, full-time employment is about getting paid for the value you have given. Absolutely. So you can achieve business success while in paid employment. You only need to apply the right strategies. Yeah. When we come back, Felix is going to thrill us on women in power. Don't go away. <laughs> Women inclusion, the need for gender equality in national leadership. Just early this week, for the first time in the history of the world, a woman became the first president of a new republic. I'm talking about Dame Sandra Prunile Mensi, who served previously as the eighth governor general of Barbados under the British monarch and head of state, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. On the 30th of November 2021, Barbados became a republic of its own, and Dame Sandra Mason became her first president. Looking at the big picture critically, we can see that a woman passed on authority to another woman, who in turn is saddled with the responsibility of leading her country and nation into the future. How lovely and encouraging this is to emerging women leaders around the globe. It is imperative that women and men should be given equal opportunities in the key decision-making rules in national affairs. The world as it is has gone beyond the constraints of parochial sentiments of patriarchy, where one gender is seen as superior and more efficient than the other. Studies and experiences have debunked the erroneous ideologies of one gender being more intellectually capable than the other. For a more progressive functional political and leadership environment, gender equality mainstreaming should be implemented. Despite the propaganda for the need of gender equality in key leadership position, Africa countries are still at the corridors of gender equality mainstreaming, since traditional beliefs and unprogressively minds are still at the hems of affairs. These misogynistic practices, if not checked, will continue the atrocities of recycled leadership and devalue the need for progressive approach to sustainability. In order to curb discriminatory policies and promote true leadership over biased and patriarchal ideologies, women and men should be given a fair share on issues that has to do with state leadership, which could play an important role in projecting meaningful 
national and foreign policies. More so, we can't talk about women participating in leadership and decision making without addressing issues like quality education for girl child, countries or territories that are being forced by violent religious extremism from majorly insurgent groups like Boko Haram, ISWAP, Taliban, tend to have regular occurrences of girls being abducted and prevented from schools and mostly forced into marriages. GBV, domestic violence against women should be addressed legally, not necessarily domestically. Effective policies should be put in place to encourage women effective participation in leadership and governance. In conclusion, an educated woman can make quality decisions and express leadership both in her household, her nation, and even the world at large. So, Juliet, let me through this. Uh, the floor is open to the two ladies here. Juliet, we like to see you to run for president of Nigeria. Why okay. Anne? Anne is going to run for president of Kenya. I to wait to see what you guys will say before I speak. <laughs> but, I mean, it's so enthralling. It's so interesting to see that a man has this belief. Because we think so as well as women. We think we are as good, sometimes better than you guys. Absolutely. But from what you have said, some organizations and some countries have actually implemented this structure of including women in leadership, in governance and all of that. But what I see most of the time is like it's more lip service than really actual positive intention. And I will explain. So we look for a woman that is very submissive that we can control, that is like a figurehead, <laughs> and just put her in on the board, <coughs> if it's a company, or put her in government as VP, vice president, vice <laughs> governor, and just say, oh, we have a woman there. And the woman has no clue Power. as to the governance of what is going on in that organization or in that country. So that's what we have seen. And that is one of the reasons you now come up and still say women are not effective. Mm. Because you also did not put the best woman in that position in the first place. So it's fine that we have this awareness. Some companies actually have it as policies, like my organization, to have women in management. So we have women in our ESCOM, in our executive committee, in our directorship. However, what we need to do further is to ensure that the best fit, whether male or female, is put up for the job. And that's where the efficiency will come. I'll tell you why. We all have different skill sets. Mm -hmm. But our gender now makes it easier for one gender to have a particular skill set that the other doesn't normally have. Like we have, we are naturally, we have this maternal instinct that comes Natural natural to us. Yeah. Exactly. We are patients. Yeah. Exactly. And it comes to, do we have hormones? The hormones can be positive and negative. You guys don't have the hormonal issue. <laughs> but if we can bring those things to governance in a positive way, it will bring about growth, to bring about progress, it will bring about prosperity, and it will be good for both the male and the female. And the female. So and that's my that wow. that uh, that uh, Absolutely. Said. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, I'll just say two things very quickly. The first thing is, I mean, I have a wife and two girls, so I'm already, you know, uh, outnumbered. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I have no choice than to ensure yeah, that trouble. my daughter becomes, you know, president someday. But oh, wow. jokes aside. One of the things that actually people think work against women, that they actually have going on for them, the hormones you talked about, emotions. Now, you hear a lot of talk about emotional intelligence. And women naturally carry those traits of emotions. It's just being able to channel it properly, right? That's on one hand. On the other hand, you know, um, I have friends that work in banks, and they said that when women are head of operations, more often than not, they thrive better than men in those roles. So you saw that men, women naturally are better managers because they're at home, they're managing your money, they're managing the children, they're managing you, you know. They say women are the, you know, the mothers of the home. So a lot of times women have this, yeah, nurturing abilities, management abilities, emotional, you know, strength, or more than not, that we think is a weakness, can be channeled into a strength. Because emotional intelligence is everything. Now everybody's talking about, you know, EQ, you know, versus IQ. So I feel that women have all the strengths that need to be channeled, and they should definitely be given a chance, you know, um, a lot of times. I, I right. yeah. Speaking like about things. emotions, Victor, before you come in, I want to just chip in something that looks more like a joke. Remember those days in our secondary school? At the military secondary school, we had the commandant, usually a lieutenant colonel at that time, mm -hmm. handling the role. So there's this particular female teacher that also assumed leadership. So we refer to her as Mamandant. <laughs> the commandant was a man, she was Mamandant. Yeah. So people want to say I was emotional intelligence. So, you know, until we fix the. Um, until we fix it's a man's world, and until we fix politics is not for the weak-hearted, and that women are weak. Now, it would be hard for us to, you know, correct the disempowered beliefs that they have sold to us. 
but it will be easier for us to begin to build a new cadre, a new generation of people, both men and women, right, who can be, begin to accord equal rights, equity. I said that, you know, sometimes on set, give the best man the job. By man, I mean either male or female. Give the best person the job. Not so why don't you just right give the best woman the job? And I mean, let, it, let it mean male or female. That's part kind of the problem, right? So, so that's a surprise. So, so you say, yeah, give the best woman. That's, so you yeah. programming this society. This, yeah, it's a program. Yeah. I, I just think that lots of things are just programmed. Right. And we cannot really, we can't intercept the program at, with these old chaps. When I mean old chaps, you know what I'm talking about. We can't intercept it. But we can go back to say, guys, let's sell you a new program. Once we can sell new programs, then we can create a new outcome, new results, and all of that. I think let's begin to let's begin doing the work, yeah. right? Anyway, with, you, with the way you are speaking, I don't know whether I will call you a software engineer or a life coach. <laughs> but in any case, uh, we need to reprogram the societal mindset <laughs> to ensure and respect everyone. Women and men have, should have equal opportunity, equal access to uh, oppor opportunities, governments, position, management, position, business, or whatever. So up next is Victor after the break. Twenty twenty two New Year falls. One of the regular pattern I've seen with people towards the end of the year is making so much misguided noise about the incoming year. People just erroneously believe that the new year will bring new results to them simply because it's a new year. This <laughs> is even what has kept us constantly where we are as a nation. We're getting closer to where Nigeria will decide her next set of leaders. We must lessen the noise and begin to re-engineer our mindsets. Thoughts create behaviors and behaviors create outcomes. A fundamental problem lies in our thought pattern. Most people have lofty wishes for 2022 with no actual well thought out plan. I believe with no out of doubt in my mind that our present leaders who may seem primitive really understand how this thinking game works. If you can keep the people caged in the same limited thinking pattern, then you can keep them externally caged. We need a paradigm shift in our way of thinking, an average Nigerian has already been defeated in their mind due to a faulty thinking pattern. We are now 27 days away into 2022. What will you do differently? What adjustments do you need to make? You must drop old limiting beliefs and pick up new ones. You must now detach yourself from disempowering thoughts and embrace a new way of thinking. This is how I strongly believe that we can all create the results that we seek and ultimately build a better 2022. There's this thing that says if you do what you always do, you get what you always get. Yeah. As an engineering um, uh, scholar or graduate, I want to use the word scholar, uh, we, we, we studied something called control engineering, feedback mechanism. You take the outputs, analyze the outputs, take the correction, which is an error, put it back into the inputs to give you the desired output. That's the way your remote control sensor works for cars and high systems. Now, you know the desired output you want, and you got something, evaluate what you, your outcome, and then if it's not what you want, come back and address it. Don't just assume that things will get better. It's a new year. We mustn't wait for 2022 to do the right thing. Start now. Mm. Absolutely agree. And I mean, my favorite quote is, Nothing will change unless you do. Very true. You know, so it's not about the environment. It's mm. not about the, the tick of a calendar. It's just another day going to another day. But sure. the 1st of December 2021 to 1st of January 2022 is just another day. Unless you determine by yourself to change your habits, to change your behaviors, to change, you know, what you've always done. Mm. If you want it, you know, a different result. So I, I totally agree with you. It's mm. not just about the year. I mean, it's just another day in the year. There's something Victor said that, I, I, that hit me, right? I thought yeah. it was profound. About thoughts influencing behavior mm. and behavior determining your outcome. I mean, that was really, really deep. I know it came up very fast and people can easily miss it. But everything starts from your mind, what you mm. think, what you believe. 
And I always tell people, when you have a belief system, when you believe something that is not favoring you, so you have to change that belief mm. to something that will favor you. Because your belief system, like he said, ultimately influences the outcomes you get. So if you think it's not possible to be wealthy, <laughs> it's a waste of time desiring wealth. Because you will never get wealthy. Because you don't even think it's possible. So you have to first of all believe it. First think it. Believe it first. Then your outcome is now more feasible. I, th I thought that was very, very deep in all of what you said, Victor. Mm. And thanks for sharing that pattern. Oh, wow. All right. So if we future paced your current actions, right, what kind of results are you going to get? So here's what I want you to do as the year comes to an end, right? Sit quietly, evaluate, recalibrate, and of course, begin to execute. We have now come to the end of this week's episodes of The Advocate. However, The Advocate continues on our social media platforms on Facebook plus TV Africa. Hashtag the Advocate NG and on Instagram at Plus TV Africa with the hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plus TV Africa.com forward slash the Advocate NG. Do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this station. Let's keep advocating for a better society. Awesome.